Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Covington Board of Education's meeting. Uh, Becky, can we call roll? Here. Mr. Here. Mr. Here. 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 All right. If we can stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you for that. Welcome again, everyone, to today's board meeting. Um, I wanted to take a moment and ask everyone to be sure that your cell phones are silenced. Uh, that way we have very little interruptions. Um, Becky, do we have any public input tonight? Okay, great. Well, before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to thank a special group who actually um, is, they're recognizing us tonight for School Board Appreciation Month. We have Blue Meringue, which is actually a part of the Cardinal Club at Latonia Elementary School. Uh, the, uh, members of the staff are given an opportunity to actually buy um, different arrangements from this club, which is, I think, a really exciting thing. But we were all personally given these beautiful arrangements done by all the individual club members, which I think is just outstanding. So I wanted to thank actually each one of the individuals who created these for us. We have Amaya, Austin, Paxton, Kristen, I'm sorry, Christy, sorry, Jalen, Haley, Cheyenne, Haley, and Jordan to thank for these. So thank you so much. We appreciate it more than you know. We are all very excited to have flowers to thank take you. home with us. All right, so we will just jump right into our agenda here. We don't have any rearranging we need to do tonight. So we will get into the Bulldog Virtual Academy. And we have we have actually quite a few people online with us tonight. We have uh, Jason Moore and we have Ben Nevels, Brad Carr. We have um, Ashley Gallagher. So I don't know who's taking over, but I will leave it up to you. So I believe I'm first and uh, we'll start okay. with the uh, initial process of how Bulldog Virtual Academy uh, began. So you can go to the next slide, Becky. So it is an application process. Uh, so we uh, sent out flyers to everyone, feelers for everyone to see who wanted to be virtual. Of those students that came in, we actually met with them and we did a student orientation as well as a parent, parent or orientation where we had a signed contract by both the parents and the students. Uh, establishing what the guidelines were and what the expectations were. Uh, we have custom BBA courses aligned for each person. We have deadlines, we have a start and end date on all courses, and we have weekly Google Meets by grade and grade checks, as well as announcements and student questions. There are BBA Google uh, uh, classrooms and Google Meets weekly for these particular students. On to the next slide, Becky. The BBA student has access to school lunches, tutoring, counseling services, in-person classes, after-school activities, and sports. And they can participate as a, as a uh, fan or as an actual student athlete. All right, and I'm up now. Um, if you could please go to the next slide. So what we have learned um, through this BBA process uh, is these keys to success um, that has made it work really well because you know we made these changes from you know CVA and virtual last year to this actual academy um, for success in our kids. So very first thing is the immediate response time from their teacher because of those interviews and applications that we did. Uh, we kept the number of BVA students limited to the amount that each teacher could handle. And that means that they can get an immediate response time via email, text message, phone call, Google Classroom. They're using so many um, resources to be able to connect to their teacher and get help with what they need. Um, and also just that um, continuous communication. 
that also means with parents. We've had a great response this year from parents, um, talking to the teachers, uh, phone calls, emails, text messages, um, just making sure that the expectation is there that you're constantly communicating with the school. Um, and like Mr. Carr said, we do have those weekly deadlines. So our BBA teachers are checking and they check those on Sundays. And that way they can kind of tell where a kid is each week and what we need to do to either get them caught up, if it's a pacing thing, if it's an academic thing, if they need grade resets, they're doing that uh, weekly. So nobody is falling through the cracks and getting left behind. Uh, the next thing is just teaching kids about edgenuity and how to look at those pacing guides and not only kids, but their parents as well. To be able to look at that pacing guide and see where they should be. And we instruct them to look at that blue, green, and red in edgenuity. And we don't want kids in the red. So we tell them, you know, you need to be in that blue and green that's on pace or um, ahead of pace in that pacing guide. And if they're in the red, that's when that weekly deadlines, um, Mr. Moore and Mr. Nevels are looking at that and saying, hey, you need to come in and catch up. Um, and speaking of that, another key to success is the access to in-person virtual time. So that's, you know, Google meets with Mr. Moore more than once a week and Mr. Nevels if needed, but also coming into their classroom here on campus where they can get help doing um, quiz resets. They might have help taking notes or just learning about ingenuity in general. Um, we can go on to the next slide, please. So what happens if a student is struggling in BVA? Uh, that's where that weekly grade accountability comes in. So, you know, your teachers are checking on Sundays and saying, this kid fell into the red. They're behind on pacing or they're failing a course. Well, then they're gonna be on the watch list. So in those Google Meets, they're gonna say first thing, hey, you're on my watch list. That means I know that you're failing this course or you're behind, you need to do X, Y, and Z to get caught up. So the next Sunday comes and they're still behind, they are in the doghouse. That's what Mr. Moore and Mr. Nevels created as their, their in-person classroom where kids have to come in, right? The expectation is that they are coming into the classroom um, until they get caught up. And the nice thing is the flexibility. So a student may come in on a Tuesday morning after they talk to Mr. Moore on Monday and they come in and they get all caught up and we can communicate with that parent and say, hey, they don't have to come in the rest of the week because they are on track and just need to continue at home and they've got those skills to do that. Um, or they are really far behind and they stay the whole week and until they get caught up. So it's really flexible based on the kid uh, and that continuous communication with their parent. Um, but then if they get to week three and they are still behind, they have now lost that opportunity to do virtual learning and they will need to come back and return to traditional school. Um, some more things that we have done for our struggling kids is home visits. Uh, Mr. Moore and Mr. Nevels have gone out and done home visits for kids who are having a tech issue or um, having other issues with resources, um, Wi-Fi, for example, that they might need help with needing um, food or other materials that it makes it hard for them to do their work. Um, and just having that conversation. If we haven't seen you in a week on a Google Meet, we're, we need to see what's up and we're going to come and, and check on you. And uh, last but not least is that in-person BBA room. You can do that even if you're not falling behind. There are some kids who have said, actually, I really need help with this algebra. I need more, more support than just my weekly Google Meet. So they can do one-on-one um, -on -one tutoring, join our after-school tutoring, be retrained on edgenuity as far as how that pacing guide works, how their course map is looking, um, where to get help um, as far as the resources that are on edgenuity, and then coming in and doing retakes on those failed quizzes. And I'm gonna pass it off now uh, to Mr. Nevels. Oh, did he just leave our meeting accidentally? Oh, there he goes. Mr. Nevels, I think you're up, sir. Oh, I have my mute mic on mute. Here we go. So uh, I'm just going to go over a few Bulldog uh, virtual stats for our middle school. Uh, let me make this bigger for my my old eyes. I can actually see it. Not a doubt. So we started. Oh. 
started off with, uh, currently we have around 42. I think we added another one uh, today to make it 43 uh, Bulldog students that are in the Holmes BVA Academy. Uh, we have a 92% passing rate, meaning that 92% of our students have at least a 60 or above. So the way we've done that and what's really neat with uh, the Agenuity platform is I can actually individualize it for the kids. So the big term has always been differentiated instruction. So in speaking with different parents, I found that some of them want their students to make at least an 80 before they can move on. So I can go into each kid and set it specifically to what that parent requests me to set it at. Uh, we offer, we have had over 240 virtual courses so far. Um, we've had approximately 13 students in uh, remediation, so Mr. Moore's uh, beloved doghouse. Three of the students came back in person after Christmas break and that was due to the fact that they were falling behind and not able to catch up. Uh, we had 40 students that started the year with us. So back in August, late August, early September, uh, we added an additional 12 mid-year for various reasons, uh, some due to you know the, the COVID uncertainty and then uh, some others behavior or what have you. We had 10 removed uh, from the program and I can't see that bottom. I think it says eight academic, and then two that were, there we go, two requested uh, to go home. Because what I like about it is we're offering as an option to everybody. It may not work great for everyone, but you have that option. And what I found is that some of our kids that would come in uh, into the doghouse, it was backfiring on them. And they loved the one-on-one -on -one individual attention they were getting, and they were tired of being stuck at home. And those were the ones that ended up requesting to come back in the school. So I think it's great that we're able as a district to offer this as a viable option. And it's a, it's a legitimate structured program and a legitimate structured uh, courses that are great for our students. You can go to that next one. Uh, this one is the celebration. So some of the celebrations we do, and that's a picture of one of our, our Bulldog of the Week students. We call him the V-Dog of the Week. Um, so what we'll do is we'll spin a wheel that I thought was the coolest thing ever. I guess I was, you know, kind of showing my childish side still. Mr. Moore showed me how to make this wheel almost like Wheel of Fortune and put all the kids' names in it. And you spin it, and whatever uh, name it lands on, that's the V-Dog of the Week. So in order to qualify to be on that wheel, uh, we have a few qualifications. You have to be passing all of your classes, so on pace, which means no red. Uh, red's usually my favorite color, but in this case, I don't like red. Uh, we make a certificate that you can see the young man holding, and then uh, also do just a little goodie bag. So one thing I like to do is ask our kids, what kind of chips do you like? What kind of candy do you like? And it's just a neat little way of saying thank you to them and reminding them that, hey, even though you're still at home, you're not alone, we're still here, you're still uh, part of the Bulldog family. Uh, students also, we're gonna be doing student of the semester, which would be like a, a little bit bigger award uh, for the students than the, than the weekly award. And also the, the, the prizes are donated through, or, or provided through our CLC after school programs. Uh, I see them playing an even bigger role in the future if we continue to have the virtual programs. Uh, I spoke with uh, Mr. Y, our CLC coordinator, yesterday about potentially adding some, some more virtual after school programs for our kids so that they can, uh, they can still be at home but still participate in things that they can have fun with. I'm going to hand this one off to Mr. Moore to bring it on home. All right, thanks, Coach Nevels. Yeah, my name is Mr. Moore, Jason Moore. Um, so I think I'm. If you get to the uh, HHS BVA stats, so when we got when we grabbed these stats, these were kind of like at the end of the semester. So um, at that time, we, we finished with uh, 87 BVA high school students, and we saw a 93% passing rate out of 459 virtual courses. So 459, it's a pretty big number. Um, but you know, we had uh, plenty of kids just 
doing very well all year long. But we did have kids that need help. This wasn't in, uh, it wasn't just simple for everyone. So we still had 13 kids. They had to come in for remediation uh, and what we call dog house. Uh, so they would come in and it's a little bit more uh, motivational, you know, mostly. Um, and then just encourage them to pay attention to the material. Um, it really does a good job if you let the program work. Um, you know, a lot of kids like to you know, shortcut, but I think they did a great job of listening and then seeing the benefits of, you know, some one-on-one -on -one attention. So uh, that uh, it, it turned out that this doghouse is, is a good thing and um, they go back and be more successful. Uh, we had five that actually uh, returned from our first semester, second semester, okay, that, that wanted to, there was a few that just wanted to. And then we had uh, uh, a few that we, because of struggling, that we brought them back. And just to, also that 93% passing rate uh, brings to mind, all those kids still had to work on their courses after it, you know, during Christmas break or whatever, to bring them to back to standard. But at that time, that was our passing rate. So, uh, and we're, I think, pretty much done with everybody getting finished. But uh, at the beginning of the year, we had 84 that applied um, and got in. Um, and if you could scroll down just a little bit, Ms. Beck, um, we had, um, 13 added mid-year for various reasons. I know, um, you know, with new enrollments and things of that nature. So a um, few individual situations. And then we had 11 removed from um, eight because of academic reasons, truly really struggling. And, you know, we did the process of our struggling students, a three week continuum and, you know, that we felt like it was better to bring them back. And, you know, the parents agreed. Um, so we could, really work with students that they wanted to, but some, a lot of them did better if they came back in. And then eight just wanted to come back in through the year. They, they, they missed it. Um, they wanted that personal interaction and in school stuff, uh, school, traditional everyday school. So, and again, like Coach Neville said, it's great that we had that. So, um, yeah, if you move on, we got a couple testimonials, um, you know, uh, that I know uh, when we go out and visit them and things of that nature, it's a lot of fun to get to see them, get to talk to them. I'm always asking them like, you know, why, why did you do this? What was the, you know, motivation? And they, you know, so I'm not going to sit here and read that to you, I guess out loud, but if you get, take a few seconds and uh, read that's Sierra and incredible student. So here's a couple of testimonials. I'll read that. And then, and then now Mr. Ethan, okay. That's one of our seniors. He's a, he's a creative writing, uh, you know, uh, uh, student. So he, he, that's his, goal he wants to be, uh, get in some journalistic uh, career so i asked him he's he's got an a average i think his lowest grades like a 94 so he <laughs> he wanted to i asked him to write one and he wrote one so it's you know quite a handful but i give you guys a second to read through that and uh, that'll kind of wrap it up for us but this is our team um you know i had to, you know, I'm last kind of low on the totem pole with this group. So, uh, but we do really good as a team. Um, it's really worked well. Uh, so um, uh, it just, the numbers, the 90% above of passing is just great. So we're really excited about it. And uh, we think the kids have done an amazing job. Amazing job. That's all we got, unless, you know, Mr. Carr, just like Gallard, if you guys have something to, you know, end it. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Moore. That, I'm, I, I personally think that that was a great presentation. I'm, I'm sure that we have questions here in the room. Um, I actually will go around the room for this one. Uh, Mr. Haggard, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions. Just uh, I think a big thank you to uh, Coach Carr, Coach Nevels, Ms. Gallagher, Coach Moore. Uh, also, I guess uh, Mr. Turner, Mr. Mm. Turnick, uh, Mr. Magner. I think that this I know you presented to us uh, in the summer, I believe, what this was going to turn out to be. I, I think you guys have set up a really great program that seems to really support our students. Uh, as Coach Neville said, make sure they're still part of the Bulldog family. Uh, so kudos to setting up a great program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haggard. Mr. Gastrate, questions? I uh, just uh, want to uh, echo Mr. Haggard's comments. Just very encouraged to see the program um, off and running and successful. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Mr. Avery, any questions? Great. Ms. Huff, do you have questions? No, just a comment. I think this is the wave of the future and I really want Covington Independent to be a star in this program. And that way the rest of our Kentuckians can learn from us. Thank you. 
thank you. I agree with Ms. Huff. I think that this is this is a huge step into um, what what is. I mean, we, this is the way we've been for the last couple of years. But this is a huge step to show that we are leaders in this this type of um, environment. So thank you so much for all you do. Um, I actually should go to Mr. Garrison. Mr. Garrison, do you have anything you want to add or ask? I would just say thank you, team. Good work. Uh, and I knew you all would do that. So just continue and we we'll appreciate your efforts. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. All right. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we can move on to the personnel actions. These are all of our informational items. Uh, we have Mr. Kippenbrock, if we have questions. There are no questions. We can move on to the, yes, that is the next one, uh, the winter surplus bids. We do have Ms. Birchie, I believe, online if there are questions about that anybody has I just especially for the new board members sure I was wondering um, if you could explain what a surplus bid is and how do people participate in it is this for for Annette for Annette, for Annette. okay can she hear us or maybe Mr. Grine or Mr. Kippenbrock you if she can't hear us yeah, I can hear you, Glenda. Um, I don't have all the details with me. They're in my office on the whole process. So I'm going to try to go by memory um, because I'm not in the trenches of the whole process. So hopefully I'll get most of it right for you. I think the bid process happens. Um, the surplus bid thing happens a couple times during the year um, where then um, Jamarcus and his team and technology work with my staff to say what should be on the surplus item or on the list. And then we actually put that list together. Uh, we send out um, information to our staff to see if they want to bid on any of that, along with putting it on our website. And then um, those bids come in sealed and uh, then it's open and then determined um, who actually wins each item, um, uh, items bid. And so then this list gets put um, out there so that you can see that that what has transpired after the process. Um, is there any other questions, Glenda, you would like me to try to add? No, I just, I have been uh, able to get things. I think I got like five monitors before that I could donate to families. And oh. so it's just a great way to um, utilize it. So I just sure. thought maybe everybody would like to know. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Thank you. Are there any further questions on this? Nope. All right. Well, we can move on to the proposed salary schedule for custodial maintenance. We have Mr. Kippenbrock here. So, <clears throat> as you all know, uh, we've been trying to address our high areas of positions that are hard to fill with services, assistance, and to transportation. Uh, and the last of those um, specials that we have, the biggest challenge in hiring right now is to destroy your. So this was the proposal that was uh, run by his cabinet, revised a couple of times, um, but uh, this is what we uh, come up with to propose to ask the people to put forward. And these questions that we come up through is just a bit. Um, the first column there is custodial, regular custodian position, and you see a um, city that's uh, a very close neighborhood. That's a very close to your county. <laughs> so uh, I tried to look at uh, the ground of that as a full specific positions with the same qualifications to match up those columns best I did. You see, and it helps to get the city within the district and also that position. Are there any questions? Is there, is there a reason our proposal doesn't go down to 27 years? I thought we were. 
we're doing that. Well, can't we reach that goal yeah. with the board's request? Mm -hmm. Again, Mr. Harrison, uh, I, I, if you were asking me my recommendation, you have it. But if the board would like to request more information, we'll be sure to get you more information. I think we should at least go up to 27 years. We've got people that's been committed their whole career to us, and we need to pay them well. I hear you. So I guess my question is, would you prefer we go on and move forward with this? And then if you want to amend it to we get you in a 27 report, and if you want to amend it to the 27, you can do so, but you will go forward with this as an informational and we provide you the 27 view at the next meeting, and then you will have a choice. You think that, yeah, okay. Yeah. Just extend it. Okay, yeah. I'm all right with that. Years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that way you have a choice again. This is my recommendation for right now, but mm -hmm. of course, we were hoping to bring that 27 point of view back to you after we have more information on what's happening with the budget session. I understand uh, that. So that's, we're still trying to be a little conservative, make sure we can, uh, we feel Thank comfortable. And then uh, we were gonna look at possibly bringing you some amendments mm -hmm. later, later on, that would be my recommendation. But again, if you all wanna see the 27 look, we'll bring that to you next month. I then. wanna see the 27 look. Okay. okay. Our other modifications we've made this year went to 27, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Um, I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, how soon would this pay increase start? So um, it is the next pay period after whenever the board approves. So if we approve next meeting, it would be the next correct. pay period. Okay. Correct. That I just want to understand that. Complete, right. Okay. I just don't want to delay the pay increase any any more than we need to make sure that our staff is getting the extra we'll pay. We'll have our choice. Of course, yeah. of course, definitely. I just wanted to point that out. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. Yes. That's all right. Question, do we have open positions, okay. custodial positions right now? We do. We do you do. know how, like what percentage? I didn't look, but um, it's a continual, um, continual challenge for us um, to fill and, and retain. And um, when they meet, when I meet with them, uh, they bring up pay and leaving for um, what they would consider uh, easier jobs where they're not exposed to as much um, right. or higher pay. Right. Um, I've had some very interesting meetings with them around that. And I, I've told them that we're working on it and the please bear with us. Do you know how many um, custodial staff we've had who have left this year? Thinking right off the top of my head, a half a dozen. Okay. Okay. So we will not put this on as an informational item because there will be a little bit more of a, well, it'll be extended a little bit further. So we'll just bring this back to the next meeting. As an approval? Uh, hopefully as an approval. That, but that you'll is, have a choice between exactly. this right. option and the other option. Two you options. might try to get that to you ahead of time. Okay. So mm -hmm. that you can have some time sure. to review of it course. and ask questions. Uh, so that's what we'll, we'll get it out ahead of time so that okay. you all can ask questions and show you the difference in the cost of this plan here versus the cost of moving it to 27 for everybody. That's what I think is significant that you really want to pay attention to. The cost of this plan versus the cost of everyone else and then what does the future look like for other employees as sure. well? Yes, so. I think that's a good plan. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to know how many staff members we have that's over 24 to where it would affect, you know what I mean? If we have and all there's that, no we, sense of taking it up to 27. If we don't have any staff members, we do. that's there. Oh, okay. we, well. we do. One of the reasons it was brought back is because we were concerned with the overall cost. I understand. Right. So. Uh, we, we have all that already prepared and ready to go, so that, that's not an issue at all. Great. Thank you. That would be great. You're 25 years, 26 years, 27 years. We appreciate you. Thank you. So, <laughs> go ahead. 
Um, my understanding was the reason that it was not extended to 27 because of the potential cost impact and not knowing where the budget is. Will exactly. we have an idea of where the budget is next meeting? I would have to uh, defer to Annette on that question. Uh, I don't know. I know she can give you the cost that we've, uh, you know, that we've done this year. She's been providing that, so she could add up the, the cost that we've done this year. And I think, I know that was a concern of mine. And then, uh, of course, I think that was a concern of Director Birchy as well. Uh, so, uh, can you, can you, did you hear that, Director Birchy? Yes, I did. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, yes, the concern that I had, the difference between 25, 26, and 27 years is a huge um, difference. So I will get you those numbers. I have most of that data already for you. So in the next day or so, I can um, email you, the board members, to give you that information so you can look over that before we bring it back to you as a board. Um, when I shared with Mr. Garrison the, the, the cost, I'm looking at everything as a whole, and I know we've only targeted a few um, categories of our staff that work for us, but there's a lot more categories we have not hit. Um, you know, I think of teachers, I think of a, a lot of other staff members that we would, if we had all this money, we would continue to keep going. And we're trying to wait to find out what SEEG is going to be next year, what kind of things are going on at the state level. Um, and that's why we were a little conservative to say, okay, let's just not go up to 27 yet because of that huge cost, because we need to look at other um you know, other categories in the staffing uh, staff and, and then try to make it all work and balance the budget. And so that's kind of um, my recommendation is we didn't go up to 27. So I just wanted to tell you how I, I, I felt about it. And would we have information in two weeks? No, because like, like I share before, this budget season doesn't really start till it gets later in the year, April, May-ish. And sometimes we find out stuff over the summer. So um, I'm just trying to make sure I can balance the budget for next year, but take care of our people because they are working hard, especially over these last couple of years with COVID, um, with the money that we receive. I look forward to seeing that 20 So if I hear you correctly, Director Bircher, you're saying that we can get the overall cost for, the, for this particular one and the projects before this together. But to Mr. Gashright's question, in comparison to the entire budget, we wouldn't have the entire budget view. Is, is that correct? Right. We wouldn't have the entire budget view. I can give you a spreadsheet of all the raises you've approved so far and the dollar amount to kind of give you a, a, a sense of what you've said yes to so far. And then I will give you analysis of what you have now and then the 27 in these categories we're talking about tonight. And I can do that within the next couple of days. Okay. So not just the custodial, but all the increases we've made i'll say this year this mm -hmm. school year mm -hmm. uh, we can yeah. see all that together yeah because i i we give you a spreadsheet of just the category we're talking about but i have a running spreadsheet of every category we said yes to so that's very easy to give you that information to see it all together because i think that's what you want to see correct steve correct I, i'm trying to look at the big picture because I know you've said there are categories we have not given a raise to, so I'd, I'd like to know <laughs> which categories those are, because those will be next. And then, I mean, it'd be some, it'd be good to have some summary that explained what percentage of our staff um, we, in terms of expense that we have given raises to versus what's to come. So what We've done all this work, it's cost us X amount, and it's X percentage of our overall, you know, personnel costs. So we can anticipate that we'll have additional expenses coming that'll help frame it because I agree that it's hard to it's hard to make a decision about one little piece of it without seeing the whole puzzle. 
And right, the biggest category we still have to do is teachers. And so that's going to be a huge expense compared to some of these adi- these other categories. Right now, the category we're talking about custodian maintenance, there's 46 people. But you know, there, you know, our teachers are the biggest bulk of our staff. And so that's right. a huge amount we have not sat and analyzed to know, to compare it and try to get competitive and raise their salaries. And so that's why we were being very conservative because I need to have some money to be able to try to look at those those staff members as well. Agreed. And Ms. Burchie, is it true that in general, those will be addressed through a percentage rather than a study like you're seeing here? Um, at least I, I, don't, I don't know if we've really determined that yet. When we've done these categories on the high need of we can't fill positions, that's the reason why um, Ken has you know brought these to the table, these categories. Um, but we know we haven't done a study on raises in a while. And so we want to get to everybody and be able to give something to everybody, but we still have to be mindful and good stewards of our money and balance our budget at the same time. And so I don't think that's been de- decided if it's gonna be across the board percentage or would we look at sales? I think that's where we have to still figure that out. So I don't wanna say yes or no completely yet. And, and to that point, I also think we need to keep an eye on what the leg- the General Assembly is doing as well, because that will have a significant impact into what we're able to do and what we're not able to do. So I have to keep pulling that, you know, reminding folks that we're in a budget session and right now and it looks promising for public education, uh, but it still has some work to do uh, around, on both sides of the aisle. So uh, hopefully it, it will continue to be positive and hopefully uh, as we stated, we'll be able to, uh, uh, but we wanted to address our critical areas first, and that's what we've done with the board's leadership and support. We've addressed, this is the last of our most critical areas, but to Mr. Kippenbrock and Director Birchie's point, this is not everybody, this is not, we just addressed areas that were critical and really uh, not aligned with around the region. So. We have more work to do, I guess is what I'm saying. All that to say, we have more work to do. I also failed to point out there were a few more categories I brought to Mr. Garrison in the cabinet at the last minute where folks were not yet making um, at least that $13 an hour range. So if you turn past custodial, um, child care worker one, uh, child care cook housekeeping, those are Chapman positions, um, health services uh, assistance, and um, clerical assistance, of which we don't currently have any, but should we fill that position again? And uh, so I did want to point that out to and get that on the record because it would change the salary schedule. In addition, I said custodial maintenance, uh, but it's it's all of these that are in that proposal. So that next page after custodial maintenance, hopefully you'll have that. And the final page is the, the cost that Ms. Birchie uh, provided by looking at literally every employee and how this proposal would affect that and the, the general fund. Okay. All right. Are there any more questions or comments? Mr. Hanger, do you have any? Okay. Didn't want to skip you accidentally. Thank you. All right. So we will go ahead and move on. We have the uh, Family Resource Youth Center. Oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. I skipped that. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, we have the contract services for Covington Partners. And do we have Stacy with us? Oh, I do see her picture up there. I, I'm here. I can um, answer any questions that folks might have. This is the annual contract that we typically submit a lot earlier in the year, but um, there we had to do the budget a little bit differently because we are. Um, The board was gracious enough to provide ESSER funds to cover two um, community learning center positions at Ninth District and at Holmes High School. And so it just took a little bit longer for us to finalize what would come out of Covington Partners and what would come out of other sources. Um, So the contract that is before you is what Covington Partners will reimburse the district for. So Covington Partners will write a check to the school district on a quarterly basis. And I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. I will open this up to questions, but before I do that, Stacy, you are looking to, are you needing this to be an approval item tonight? Um, 
it's it's not time sensitive, um, okay. but so we can sure. go through the process if if that's what the board would like. Okay, I just want to make sure that I understood what your ask was. Sure. Thank you. I will open it up to questions, um, Mr. Haggard. I don't I don't have a question. Obviously, everyone in this room knows my love for Covington Partners and the work that they do. But it is at, at a moment like this, just to realize how lucky we are as a board of education that a nonprofit is going out finding resources to pay us so that our students can have great support services. I think um, just need to count ourselves very lucky. That's all. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Haggard. Steve, any no thoughts or questions? No questions for me. All right. Ms. Huff? Uh, Mr. Garrison, this is the item that I would like to talk to you about. Yes, ma'am. Before we vote on this next next time yes ma'am okay mr avery anything you okay all right well thank you miss miss strotman uh before i move on to the, you yes. move on to the next item i hope you guys enjoyed your bouquets that were made by blue meringue here oh, at yeah. um the cardinal club at latonia elementary the students in blue meringue put those together for you and they do such a great job so hopefully you're enjoying your gifts from them Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. Stacey, we really are. Thank you so much. Oh, great. All right. So so now we're going to the Family Resource Youth Center. Um, we are on, let's see, who are, do we have? Oh, is, uh, is Janice with us tonight? Yes, I am. Oh, you are. There you are. So every two years, the Family Resource Centers and Youth Services Centers uh, reapply to keep their centers running. And we typically ask for board permission to do that. So we would love to have that consent from you all to continue operating our centers and apply for these next grants. When's the application deadline? It's in March, so we have a bit of time. Okay. Okay, great. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Can we just put that on the consent? Agenda? I was just gonna ask the same thing. Um, are you guys okay with this? Okay, we will put this on the consent agenda. All right, we can move on to number seven. And I think that uh, Dr. Wilkerson, you are going to speak on behalf of Director Foley tonight, if I remember correctly. I will do my best, yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do see that our, our numbers are going down. That is a, a definite positive spin, but it's still incredibly high. Um, I don't know if, yeah, I was just gonna, I just saw you guys get that out. We do have the data in our red folders tonight, along with the new um, the new flow chart, which I think is very helpful. And I will just open the floor for anyone who has questions or concerns. I was just curious about the, the new guidelines and how we're addressing that or if the staff, more the staff is having any issues with the new guidelines. I'm gonna defer to Dr. J right now, Ms. Huff, so she can do the best she can, I think. I will she... do the best I can. I am not Jen Foey. I call her Dr. Jen as well, simply because she, has, <laughs> she is masterful of this information. Um, I think the staff have had some questions as have some of our families simply because this is complicated and every time it changes um it's it, it's presented to us as being straightforward from uh the state health department but when schools dig into it it is quite um quite challenging to go through each of the nuances and i know jen and and some other health coordinators around the region had many conversations with our local health department with folks from the state to make sure that we were interpreting things correctly and getting those those answers as best we can. Um, a couple of the challenges, one, one of the good things is um, the state is saying that we no, no longer have to do contact tracing um, in the school setting. We certainly inform parents, but we are not required to do contact tracing. And I think that came in part that the state looked at the data that many of uh, many people who are identified as close contacts fortunately never tested positive for COVID. So that's that's a great use of the data. I think that's gonna be 
very valuable to our, our staff, um, our nursing staff in particular, as those have been done thoroughly, they've been done correctly, and that means they've been very time consuming. Um, each of the changes that came to us from the state were carefully reviewed. Uh, we talked about them with Mr. Garrison, and we tried to, to go through this process so that they, we were as closely following the state guidelines as we could, but also making them work, work for us. Uh, we're continuing to have the dashboard available on the district website so that folks can see on a day-to-day -day basis um, how, many how many folks are impacted by, by COVID. So that's still there as well. Um, the flow chart is as straightforward as it can be, given that this is a complicated um, process, but I, there have been questions and I think Jen and her team have answered those really well. Dr. J, if I can interject something right there, if you don't mind, one thing sure. that Dr. Foley pointed out to me, and I think her and some of the other uh, directors around the region have also expressed this. So I took it to the states. Uh, I made them aware of it as well. A lot of times the, the people that work on the guidance for schools may not be school people. And so they are doctors, they're, you know, lead or, or, or you know, just lead health professionals. And so what the what the feedback I got from Director Foley and some of the folks around the region is perhaps before they roll out the guidance to districts, maybe they should have some school people review it first before they roll it out. That way school people wouldn't have as many questions about it after they don't put a document out. Of course, they're trying to meet timelines and deadlines and whatever else because COVID is real and fluid and, and people are dealing with it in real time. But I think if they take time to let school people review it before they put it out statewide, that may save all of us some frustration. That's why when we first received it, we just didn't roll it out to everybody. We wanted to make sure we could adopt it the best we could to our schools and our district, because if not, we would, you know, although we're having some questions, it could have been many more like the state was when they first rolled this out because it was not in school, wasn't looked at through the lens of school practitioners. Thank would you, you agree with that, Dr. J? Yes, very much so. Um, Jen said in, initially when it came out, they had more questions than than some of the previous guidance that it, it just, there were just things that hadn't been thought through, as you said, from a school perspective. So thank you. All right. Um, I guess we- I have one, I have one more question. Oh, sure. Uh, Dr. Wilkerson, are we still using the um, our, those contract nursing services that the board approved in the fall? We have one of those folks still working with us, but that's it at this time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do, do we have the flow chart up on on the dashboard as well? Is it's, it is it on? It's on, it on, the, on the website. It is okay. All right. I think that that's really my only question. I think it's very clear, and you can kind of just I I, I love a flow chart, so I I appreciate it. Takes the guessing out of it. Um, some people love it. Some people hate it. We, we will. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't misunderstand me. I definitely don't like this, but it's very it's very easy to guide yourself through it. Good. Less questions. Less questions. So very, good. very much appreciate that. Um, and I think that we can move on. Let's see. We have coming up. Oh, we are going to talk about remote learning. So this is really just going to be an, a, an open conversation, but I will let Mr. Garrison take the lead on this. Well, first, I want to thank you all again for your leadership and support around these remote learning issues and, and remind whoever's listening out there that this whole, you know, COVID experience has been a very fluid uh, situation that's uh, a lot of tough decisions, a lot of, lot of thinking, a lot of debating, a lot of trying to figure it out, build the, build the plane while you're flying it. So I appreciate the board's flexibility and patience and leadership on this issue. So at our last meeting, we had some discussions. I think we discussed uh, several items, uh, but for me, I guess where I wanted some guidance from the board is, okay, uh, how, how, do we, how do we wanna do this going forward around remote learning? And now we do have those 10 days that we discussed at our previous meeting where we actually have two NTI 
district-wide days we have left. And then we have 10 new remote learning days per school. And so I, I would just like to know is what the role of the board versus the role of the superintendent, because I just want to make sure that every board feels like they're being heard, or every board member feels like they're being heard, and that I'm meeting your expectations around this issue. So I just need some guidance on what my expectation, what you all expect from me as it comes to, you know, if a school needs to go to remote learning for a day or two because of staffing issues or maybe a student issues, I just need some guidance. Would you like to call special meetings? Just let me know how we need to proceed because I want to, again, make sure I'm meeting your expectations. Well, can I start? Because that was the one that really, I guess, threw some wrenches in. And I'm, COVID is so fluid. Mm -hmm. It really is. And things can change on a dime. And so I'm totally fine with you and your staff making that decision on whether a school needs to go to remote. I would just like, as a board member, for either you to send out an email to say this is what we're going to do and this is the reason why that way i have information if i get phone calls or visits that and that's where i stand on that all right um we'll just go around the room i agree with miss huff um just a heads up would be would be nice um it's been pointed out several times that we would come to you for the data that you already have. So you're you're already working through the information well before we would even be notified. So I do trust your guidance on what you think is best for a particular school or for the district. But just a heads up would be great. One one clarifying point. Yes. Uh, because I've heard from three of you now, and I hope you're other. So email or a phone call, because I've tried to call each one of you when making um, decisions an like that. An email is Go fine on. because then we have actual talking points. We have numbers in front of us or or things that maybe we will forget right. in a phone call. So having it in front of us is, is always something we can refer back to. Right. And your time is valuable as well. So if it takes you <laughs> call 10, <Jerry. laughs> uh, call uh, 10 minutes to call each one of us to explain when you could do it in two minutes it's true three minutes to all of us then we can call you or mm -hmm. if need be right i'm just concerned about the one i'll just give you an example of the last time we did this the decision that we made on a wednesday for thursday we were not able to put all the information in the need mail till thursday i think around midday because we had to compile all the data if we had waited till if 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 you all wanted the data to support that decision all we had was anecdotal data at that time. We couldn't put all the data together until the next day, and that's when the email went out to everybody. I, so it, it might be an email saying we have to do this, but I may not have the time to get everything you all want to know to why mm -hmm. the decision was made. That's Mr. the Garrison, yes. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. Okay, I'm just trying to meet <laughs> your just, just send us an email. Holmes is going to remote learning for Thursday and Friday because of staff. That's okay. good. Sure. Also, I just wanted to point out that the last time we were coming out of a long period of time where we weren't collecting data from students and from faculty. So we were catching up. So that was it was definitely a, a hard situation because we were walking into being out for two and a half weeks. I and if you can't do it, yeah, sure. or somebody. Uh, Mr. Gastrate. Yeah. So just echoing, I think, um, Mr. Garrison, you and your team has the authority to make that decision. And I would say for me, the metric is success is maximizing the number of student in school days, right? And so that's more complex now because now we've got the opportunity to close some schools and leave some open. So if you think about a situation where I almost feel like each school now has to figure out what are their red flags for reaching out and identifying that they need to close, right? Um, I would also think that if you have staff issues at two schools, there may be a way to keep one of them open by flexing staff from one school 
those are hard decisions because you're picking and choosing. But I think, you know, and we, again, this is conjecture. It's not a situation that is necessarily about this week. But the next time there's a flare up, we start to see those cases rising. We need to be ready to say, hey, if we have two schools that need to close, you know, the one with the most staff out is going to be the one that has to flex to keep the other one open, whatever. And then, you know, we try to keep equity in the number of days between schools. So these are all, again, variables. I think your team is able to look at what those options are going to be and make decisions. And you don't have to be perfect every time that we can have a learning process in this. But I would say for me, the metric's going to be number of in-person right. school days for our kids, especially at the elementary level mm -hmm. where in, you know, probably middle school where, you know, it really makes a big difference. Right. Mr. Haggard. Um, yeah, I, I think we're all coming to this with, you know, our, we want to keep kids in school as much as possible. I think uh, Mr. Garrison and his team understands that. I think this is why we have a superintendent and put our trust in him to make these decisions based on the data. Um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, you know, our families, unfortunately, always do not have the luxury of staying home with students when we have to close school. So as mindful as we can be and as much notice as we can be, and I know with the school by school thing, that might be a little tricky too. If you got kids at the elementary school, you got some kids at the middle school, what are you doing? So I just having our family's voice in these decisions, I think will be helpful as well. Thank you. All right, I think good? I'm good. All yes. right, well, great discussion. I appreciate everybody's input. All right, we will move on to the report of the treasurer. We, I believe still have Director Birchie online. Annette, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, <laughs> okay great. Um, the first thing in your packet is the um, school activity funds. I bring this to you twice a year. So the first six months were July through December. And it shows the beginning balance, the receipts, which is your revenue, the disbursements, which are your, the expenses, and then their ending balance. So this is red book funds that stay at the school level. So we've been doing this for several years now, bringing it to the board, just giving them a snapshot um, of uh, the money in those accounts versus when you see financial reports from the board, it's um, through Munis, our financial system, and Red Book's not in here. So um, I bring it twice a year. If you have any questions, I'll answer them. All right. Do we have any questions on uh, the school activity fund balances? Nope. Okay. That one is an informational item, so I will let Annette continue. The next item is um, ESSER funds. Uh, we, as the district and leadership said, we would bring you information um, quarterly in, to re in regards to what is being spent in ESSER funds. So I put uh, spreadsheets together and um, so December 31st was the end of the quarter, so then I'll, I'll bring it to you in January sometimes, and then the next one would be after March 31st, we'll bring it to you in April. Um, so that's kind of how, how it will work. The first um, spreadsheet is ESSER 1, which this is our first pot of money from back when um, COVID started. There's not any fluctuations in regards to our money, the district money, but I thought it would just be good to show you um, we still do have balances left with the non-public allocations. So it's those Catholic schools. So I added a little um, uh, narrative at the bottom in regards to they still have about $25,000 left. So if you ever question a financial report, it's not our side of the money from ESSER. We have spent ESSER 1. We try to spend ESSER 1 before we start ESSER 2 versus then start spending ESSER 3. So that looked a little different than last time because I thought I would add that non-public um, allocation. So if you have any questions about that, I'll answer those before I move on to ESSER 2. And then I have one small question. Going sure. back to the private school allocations, do you have to keep, do 
do, do you have to keep track of their spending? Or I guess I just misunderstood. I thought you just, we just them cut money. them a check and then it no, was. No, I wish it would be that way. We're grateful that ESSER two and three does not have a non-public allocation. KDE is taking over that and they've learned the hard way that it's a lot of managing of this money. Right. They, they get a budget. We have a team, um, support services that helps the non-public turn in information to our financial system. It goes through Munis. So say a school gets $5,000, they submit information. They want to buy computers or, or, or whatever they want to buy. They submit that information. We create the requisition and the PO to actually then place the order with the vendor. And then we're actually paying the bill. So my staff is involved in all that along with support services. Um, Ms. Heron down in uh, support services, she helps with the non-public and, and um, Ms. Thompson, they oversee that. So it, it's just like we're spending, it's not our money, but we're actually doing all the paperwork to it. And so then when they're not spending money, we're reminding them gently, this money's re, uh, going away, you need to spend the money. So it's a huge challenge to make sure they spend their money. Uh, how, how many schools does this amount support? Is it several? I would assume several. I'm going to guess eight to 10 to 12. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, you have other districts that only have one or two Catholic schools, but we have a lot of Catholic schools in this area. And so we have the volume. And so Title I, they get money for Title I. So there's a lot of grants that they, that we'd have to do the same process with Title I money, ESSER money, and, you know, and so it's a huge part of just running things through our financial system. I, I don't think that I ever realized that you guys were actually doing all of the work along with it. I thought it was just this amount. I mean, that when I think of allocation, I think this is allocated to you and here you go. I uh, wish we could just cut a check to them. Nope, because it comes through us. And so yeah. then once the money's spent, that's when I request it from KDE and say, okay, we've spent this money, please reimburse the district. So we are actually taking cash flow and paying for our bills until then I can ask for the money once the things get paid. Hmm. So wow. one question for me, I know I've asked you this many times about Title I. When is it a point where we can say, okay, they're not spending the money. We're going to give them this one last opportunity to spend the money or, or else we're taking it back. Do we have that option with ESSER, with this ESSER one money? Because that deadline, if I'm not mistaken, would be this September, wouldn't it? I thought. Um, ESSER one does expire September, 2022. I mm -hmm. know what title one does. Ms. Thompson is very gracious and keeps, um, uh, pestering them in a nice way. Hey, you have this money, you have this money. What do you want to spend it on? Because ultimately she's trying to let them make the decision. Sometimes she will buy some things for them that she thinks will be good for our kids. So I know she does that as well sometimes. And we usually just make it work that the schools spend, those non-public schools actually spend the money. Um, that's on Title I. Now this is Esther, we haven't got to that yet. Um, we need to probably have some conversations um, with Ms. Thompson, Mr. Grime, Mr. Alter, how they would wanna look at that in regards to the Esser. Um, I don't know if there's anything in statute or law that says that we really have a drop down date. We just try to work with them to have them spend the money. And that's because we are great neighbors and I say we keep trying to work with them. <laughs> Uh, but at some point we might have to put a deadline on them just to, um, just to try to hustle them along. Yeah. Because it's hard when you have several pots of money, you know, open, you can't put anything to bed, so to speak. And you're always trying to spend money. And I never want to send money back to the, the, the state, you know, our money at the district level or even non-public allocation. I just don't think it, it, it looks good. And so we work very hard to spin our wheels to not have that happen. I understand. Well, thank you, Annette. You're welcome. Um, are there any other questions? That's on ESSER 1, so I can oh. go on to ESSER 2 because I'm right. sure this is our our pot of money. Non-public's not in it. So you'll see two different spreadsheets. One is um, direct services, which is the 55.4 GD spreadsheet. And then the other um, pot of money is not direct services, which is 55.4 
uh, 4G. So what I tried to do is instead of just giving you a, a financial report that's hard to read and not knowing for sure what they're actually buying, I tried to take it down another level in detail. So it's kind of um, set up the same way what you saw before. It lists the department or the school. It gives a description, then it gives amount, and then it gives a, a total. Now, I know Mr. Haggard asked last time if we would add percentages to it. So I did that at the bottom um, for you as a board to see. So if we're looking at spreadsheet 55 4G, it is showing that as of 1231, we spent about $1.8 million out of the allocation of 3.9, which is about 46 and a half percent. That's on G. And we, you do the same thing on GD and it shows the description in the departments or schools. And we have spent 2.6 million almost out of the 5.3 million. And we've spent about 48, 49% so far. Keep in mind sometimes allocations between the school changes from G to GD because they might um, have extra money left over from the plan they submitted to leadership and was approved. And so depending on what they're buying, their allocation might switch from G to GD or GD um, back to G. And so it's never going to be the same dollar amount. So if you see that dollar amount at the bottom change every quarter, that is some of the reasons because we're, we're moving back in between those pots. So I just wanted to make sure if you're comparing quarters, you're gonna say, why is this number keep changing? I just wanted to tell you um, that. So um, I don't know if you have any questions about descriptions of stuff. I mean, the things that I see that jump out at to me is there's a lot of technology we kept buying, which is great. Um, in, in both of those pots, there's a lot of instructional materials. If you see the um, software and um, that's being able to educate our kids when they're remotely. So those are big ticket items that are on there as well. Um, so I will open it up for any questions from anybody and I'll um, more than happy answer them for you. <laughs> Mr. Hager, do you have questions? Yes, okay. uh, I got one question first would be uh, for Director Birchie, the spending deadline for ESSER 2 again is when? ESSER 2 is September of 23. Okay. And then I guess my other question is, he's not in here, but uh, maybe for Director White. Uh, so this is a lot of technology. And I know, uh, I think Mr. Gastride has brought this up before when we're talking about spending plans. You know, this technology is going to outdate itself and three, four, five years. And I, I know, I think Director White talked in his presentation over the summer about some sort of management system. So we know when we bought something, when it's ready to be updated so we can get a better sense of when these devices are gonna be toward the end of their useful life. I think that's something that I'm really interested in to see how we can continue sustain um, some of these investments that we've made in technology and be ready for them uh, for, from a budget standpoint. I know um, Mr. White is working on that, updating that system um, that he, of course, when you buy anything new, uh, you have to down or upload and get all the information. So I know he's still working on that. I'm, I'm not, uh, know a lot of information about it, but I just know he is working on that. So I assume when that gets done, we can bring some of that information to the table, to the board for you. Other than that, I'd have to refer to um, Jamarcus in regards to all the technology and stuff or Mr. Garrison. I would ask Mr. Alter, do you have any update on any of that, what the status is? I know that uh, Director White's been looking into that and working on it. I'm just not quite sure I know the status. Are you aware of anything? Okay. Oh, I'll check with Director White. I mean, Director White, and either get something out to you, or maybe if he's if he's about finished, we'll present it to the board. But if it's not quite finished, I'll follow up with him on that. All right. Are there any further questions? The, the issue with paying with ESSER funds, uh, when we initially had, um, when we initially uh, told, talked to schools and directors about ESSER 
funds, we asked them to stay away from personnel. And and when we were approving plans, I think we only approved one or two plans that had personnel in it, and it was mainly around intervention personnel. One, the sustainability after the money's gone, and two, the uh, amount of benefits where a, a, play, a, a person paid out of general fund, a certified person paid out of general fund, and uh, a Director Burchett, correct me if I'm wrong, I think our benefits cost is about three to six percent, and that's where I'll need Director Burchett. But when you pay out of Title I or ESSER or any federal grant, grant they jump up to 28 percent. So uh, you, you just don't, you, you, it's, it's not, a, in my opinion, it's not always the best way to spend that money when you're paying that amount of benefits. Director Burchett, are my numbers correct, or where are you at now? Yeah. <laughs> um, when you pay for anything out of a federal grant, like Mr. Garrison said, Title I and ESSER is a federal grant, the retirement percentage alone is, if it's general fund, it's 3%, and if it is ESSER, it's 16.105, and that's only on retirement. And then also another fringe that you have to pay is the health insurance because in general fund, the state pays our health insurance. And so I always quote me, I'm, I have a single plan and it's like $700 a month. So it's like $7,000 for me and I'm, I'm a single plan. So if you have a family, it could, it could raise that budget salary up another to eight to $10,000. So the fringes are very expensive when you pay for it out of a federal grant. And so we did do put salaries in there for our virtual teachers because we needed that. And that was a direct impact because of COVID. And then we do have those ELL staff um, uh, members in there, but we have been talking about that. That is a conversation we will be having in the budget committee because how are we gonna sustain that because the ESSER money is going away. It's on my notes to talk about because we were only gonna put that staff in for ESSER two for one year. So that would be be talked about in the budget committee on how are we going to bring that back into the general fund. And that was the other point I was going to make. Thank you for reminding me of that, Director Virtue. The uh, most positions you approve through ESSER dollars is a one year. Even when the schools created their plan, they knew it was only for one year because, again, the, the, the end is what about sustainability? And so, like with those, with our ELL staff, that's going to have to be a way that we sustain that because our ELL staff is growing. It's not, it's not going to change. So we realize somehow at some point we're going to have to assume those costs, not through ESSER, but to our general fund. And it's figuring out a plan to do so. Uh, but uh, the other positions that you've approved, like she said, you approved, I think, the, the support with the nurses, the health people, we, that was through ESSER. So we knew that was only for this year only at this point, you know, at what we were thinking. Uh, you approve, like she said, the virtual teachers, you approve, uh, I think, uh, the middle school new program, that was only one position. And uh, there at the middle school, I think there was some approval of in one or two schools. I know Latonia, in their plan initially, they asked for some support, personnel support. And I can't remember if that was one or two positions, but again, okay. Latonia, I think, was two, and they're only been able to fill one so far, yes. I think. So it hadn't been many positions, and we've been, again, cautious about hiring positions through that funding source. Uh, but, you know, we'll keep, man, yeah, we'll keep watching that and keep an eye on that for you so that if you do, I guess Mr. Grimes wants to come to the <laughs> monitor. One other question that kind of ties into this. You have to really be careful with the rest of the fund also. You know, that's a plan thing. And Bill, you were fading in and out. Are you talking about supplanting? I think I've heard talking about supplanting and things. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. I mean, they're very KDE's talking about you can't sit here and take general fund salaries and constantly be putting in an ESSER because it's supposed to help 
in regards to the pandemic and COVID. And, and we have to sustain our local effort. And so what that means is any money we're spending already now, we can't then say, okay, general fund, we're going to move it into Esther because our local effort would go down. And so that's where supplanting comes in and things like that. So we have to be very mindful of what we are, what salaries we are putting in um, Esser because we don't want to get in that gray box and have to worry that we're supplanting. And along that same thread, uh, we just had Director White work, walk into the room. So that first question that was asked, I don't think I can repeat it, but I can ask the board member to go back to us about the managing our technology as we purchase new, keeping that database or information. Could you give the board an update on where we are with that? And, and it, I know you've been working on that, but they just wanted an update since we were on this thread around ESSER 1 and ESSER 2. So. Yeah, I was just, I, obviously this report on ESSER 1 and 2 was a lot of technology. Yeah. And so we were talking about yeah. how are you and your team managing it? Also, how are we going to make sure that we can budget appropriately in future years when some of these devices are, end, you know, getting to the end of their useful life? Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Did we answer your question there, uh, Ms. Huff? We weren't sure if we got to it, but that's, hope we answered it. All right. I think we can move on to the monthly financials, Annette. So um, the normal monthly financials are um, in your packet. So you have the Munis financial report along with the balance sheet, some spreadsheets on um, how much money is in our bank account along with all our warrants. And then the budget narrative that gives you kind of a snapshot of just saying how much cash is in the bank versus how much expenses and revenue we have. And so it's the normal um, monthly inf information that I provide to the board. I will answer any questions anybody has. Are there are any questions? All right, I just need a motion to approve the, um, the warrant expenditure and the monthly financial. I move to approve the warrant expenditure and the monthly financials. I'll second. Second. Mr. Gashright? Second. Mr. Gashright? Yes. Mr. Gashright? Yes. Mr. Gashright? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Haggard? Yes. And Ms. Farley? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Annette. All right, we are on to the consent agenda. Moving right along. Is there anything? anyone would like to pull from the consent agenda before approving? No? Okay. I move to approve the consent agenda. I second. Okay. Second. Ms. Huff? Yes. Mr. Gashtrike? Yes. Mr. Haggard? Yes. And Ms. Butters? Yes. All right. We do not have any individual approval items, nothing on the, there's no addendum. So I guess we will go on to, is there a report from the attorney? So I do not have a report, um, although I will ask for at the end of the meeting for a motion to go into uh, executive session pursuant to KRS 61-810-1K, discussions of matters which are otherwise confidential by state and federal law. 
All right. Um, do we need a motion to go in the executive? Is we it? will. Uh, yeah. Do we want to do any? Yeah. With that. Were, yeah, I was just going to do the further. I was just. Yeah, I was just going to do the. I. Um, this is kind of when we do the the new items. If there is anything that we would like to put on the table for discussion in the future, um, I believe Miss Huff has called it the parking lot. <laughs> so if anybody has anything open discussion something that we would like to um look into for the future future discussions Thank you, Tom. That was that. I think it's really important to recognize the people that help us through our lives. So thank you. Um, so no further discussion. So we will just, if we want to take a second and look through the calendar, we have a lot of important events coming up. Uh, we have our board retreat happening this weekend, which I'm very excited for. Uh, we also have, um, let's see, we have KSBA coming up. If you know what you would like to do at KSBA, please get that to Becky as soon as you can so that we can get everything scheduled. What else? Spring break. I keep talking about spring break. I'm very excited for that. And I think that's really it. We have a lot of board meetings coming. <laughs> um, and I just need a motion. So I, right. Yeah. So uh, I would request a motion to go into executive session. Pursuant to KRS 61.810, subsection 1, subsection K, discussions which would are otherwise confidential under state and federal law. Um, I would also add, um, I do not anticipate uh, that any action will be taken after the executive session. I'll make what she said, that motion. And I'll second what she said. Before we go into executive session fully, Mr. Garrison had something to say. I skipped him. I apologize. I just want to remind the board about your Kanye interviews. Yes. We will try to send you a little cheat sheet this weekend. Just of uh, well, we'll pray it out tomorrow. Just some things, topical questions they could ask. Just to remind you that you know things that you talk about at board level. You have. I think Becky did put a uh, form in there of things we've covered throughout the year, so you can refer to that. I just didn't want you to feel. Call me a review. They're going to interview you, you guys. I know you're going to do great, as I can see all of your great test takers. Uh, but just want to remind you that's coming up, and just don't forget to uh, read the, any information we send you about Cognia, because we're trying to give you uh, so you're not blindsided on some things they might ask. And it's always going to be about academic data. Do, you, do we keep you informed around data? Do we keep you informed? Or just mainly data. Mm -hmm. to make sure that you feel informed. It's not anything intimidating. Some of you have been through it before. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure if you are, if you do feel like you don't feel prepared, please call us sometimes before you interview. You can reach me anytime, but we will send something out. Probably tomorrow. Just saying, here's some potential stuff they might ask. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, I'm sorry for, for not going over that. I apologize. And I think that we are ready to go into... We had well, a, have to have a vote. Oh, we have to vote. I apologize. We had a first and a second. Sorry, Becky. Yes, Mr. Gashtrack. Yes. Mr. Avery. Yes. Mr. Haggard. I'll abstain. And Ms. Huff. I'm Yes. Thank you, everybody. We'll turn off our microphones.